Hello and welcome to The Crucible. This is our weekly show where we discuss issues that we find important to secular humanists. I am Skids the Clown and I'm one of the hosts this evening. But before we get started, I do want to take a moment and first of all, thank those who are helping behind the scenes on tonight's show. Uh, thanks to producer Wes, who's always great at uh, keeping everything going backstage. We also have Sunny Shell working behind the scenes and everybody in the audience. Thank you for stopping by. If you like what you see on this channel, please make sure you hit that like button, share the video, and remember to subscribe to the channel if you would like to see more content from the Promethean Secular Frontier. And don't forget to visit our website where you can find links to all of our content, including our Discord channel, where there's a lot of fun stuff to see. And make sure you also check out the other shows on this channel. That includes The Secular Soapbox, The Borg Skeptic Show, The Bible Says What?, and our newest show, The One Good Reason, hosted by Mike Carey. Now, speaking of the secular soapbox, let me bring our other host in for this easy evening, our very own Caleb. Hello, there hello. He is. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing great today. I'm getting excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to hear these people talking nerdy to me. That's right. We are definitely discussing a very nerdy topic tonight. We're going to be talking with Dr. David, uh, a very uh, favorite guest of mine. I've worked with him before on some other shows, um, but we're going to be talking about black holes. So um, like I, I said before this show started, I'm not the expert on this. Um, I saw the old Disney black hole movie back in 1979. So that's about where my expertise ends. So I brought Caleb in because he loves this stuff. So he's going to help us uh, get this conversation rolling. So um, before I bring him in, let's get started with our subject. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good evening. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing great. great. Caleb is chomping at the bit. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and turn the, the show over to you for a moment and just kind of tell us a little bit about how you got interested in the subject of black holes. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm, I'm a physics professor. And I was always fascinated by the ideas of relativity and black holes emerge from what's called the general theory of relativity. So, I mean, we can get into that, but uh, Einstein was thinking about space and time and he was looking at other physical theories and in these other physical theories, he noticed that the, the, the speed of light emerged as a constant, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a very strange feature of the world. Uh, it turns out that regardless of how we're moving, the speed of light uh, always has the same value. And that's actually an amazing thing if you think about mm -hmm. it. Our intuitive notions of, of uh, the way space is, sort of as a collection of all possible positions, and time is some kind of parameter that that increases, um, you know, so you, if you imagine light as, as, as a, as some kind of particle that's traveling and you measure it and it's moving very fast at some value with respect to me and you get in your spaceship and start chasing that particle of light, right? It's, it's intuitive to us that the particle particle of light should be going slower with respect to you because you're going faster than I am. You're moving towards that particle. In, in some sense, you're sort of catching up to it. Now, as you can imagine, going very close to the speed of light in your spaceship, mm -hmm. and so you can imagine that the particle of light is almost traveling with you, hence uh, almost zero speed with respect to you. And instead, it turns out that you would also measure that same particle of light to be traveling with respect to you at the same speed that I measure, just sitting in my office. And that's an amazing thing. So that's where you realize something's 
in our common sense notions doesn't work. And what you have to do is because since speed involves space and time, you're really changing, curving, or warping both space and time such that the speed of light is always the same regardless of how you move. And that's really what the special theory is about. Um, and things like EA equals MC squared just come out of the, the mathematical structure that, that's there to ensure that the speed of light is always a constant regardless of how you move it. And then it's kind of like a step away to get to the general theory because the idea is, well, you know, you're moving with respect to me at some speed, I'm moving with respect to you at some speed, but what about different kinds of motion? What about accelerated motions where you change your speed? Right? You want the theory to incorporate all kinds of motion. What do those observers or experimenters measure when they're measuring things like the speed of light? And so, and then Einstein, and, you know, we can discuss this in 10 seconds, but it took Einstein 10 years to put this together. And, and the idea was this equivalence principle, which basically said acceleration and gravity are the same. And in 10 seconds, uh, right, this sort of brings in gravity into the idea of curved or warped space and time. Um, so when you say that they're the same, do you mean that to say that they're functionally identical or that they are actually the same thing? Space and time? Um, acceleration and gravity. Right. So uh, what, I, what I mean by that is that in a situation where uh, you are accelerating in your car mm -hmm. or if you want in your rocket ship, you'll exper experience the exact same behavior uh, of things around you as you would if, if you're just sitting where you are right now on the surface of the earth and you let things fall they would behave in exactly the same way. So th this wasn't something that Einstein discovered. People knew this beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like a strange coincidence. From, so from the perspective of previous physics, Newton's physics, um, when you, where you think of gravity as a force, strangely, the, there, there's a part of massive objects that pulls on other massive objects, and mm -hmm. that goes on the side of the force. And then there's a part of, of the mass of... Uh, there's a part of an, an intrinsic notion of, of, of mass of an object that goes on the other side, the, the acceleration side, right? In this famous equation, F equals MA, and both of these two masses, right? The, the inertial side is where the mass sort of resists being pulled by a force, and on the other side, it goes in as pulling other objects. For some reason, those two masses are exactly the same. That's just a strange coincidence in Newton's theory. Okay. It has no explanation, whereas in in Einstein's picture, it makes sense that they should be the same because it's really not a force. Gravity is the curvature of space-time. It's a very counterintuitive idea, but this is where the ideas emerge from. And when you know, it took Einstein a decade to put the mathematical structure together for this idea. Um, so, and, so, and black hole, sorry, black holes emerge from that mathematical structure. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, you had mentioned earlier that um, you can have two different objects moving um, at different speeds relative to, say, the center of the Earth. So we have to, like two supercharged cars. One's moving at like 25% of the speed of light. One's moving at 50% of the speed of light. And uh, is it, so let me just make sure I have this correct. Uh, so it is the case that regardless of which vehicle you find yourself in, the speed of light from the flashlight in front of you is going to be the same. Like that, that particle is is going to be appear to be moving at the same speed, regardless of if you're. That particle is actually moving at the same speed, mm -hmm. right? We, we can both do our measurements, and we'll find the exact same speed, despite the fact that that you are that we're moving with respect to each other. Okay, so mm -hmm. how um, was it the case that this is a um, um, something that you can derive from? Uh, uh, general relativity, or is, uh, to, to get the fact the that the speed of light is a constant? Yeah, or is this something that you need to know? That's a much more to... primitive idea. So, so you could, you could. Um, this is not the way Einstein went about this, as far as I know. Uh, I'm not an historian, but uh, people were measuring the speed of light in the 1800s. Uh, you know, when, when Einstein was, was, was just born, they had already done some of these experiments, I think, or right about that time, 1880s. And um, they found that regardless of the motion, you, you always get the speed of light. Now, as far as I understand, Einstein wasn't paying attention to these experiments. He, he went about uh, 
getting at this principle that the speed of light is the same regardless of how you're moving by looking at uh, the theory of electromagnetism. So in the theory, theory of electromagnetism, you find strangely that electric and magnetic fields, uh, when you put all the equations together, they obey a wave equation. And what they're basically telling you is that electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light. The speed of light pops out of these equations, right? So I'm, I'm actually teaching that course uh, right now, and, that, and we're sort of building up these equations. And, and by the end of the semester, we'll see that these strange numbers that, that appear in the equations uh, combine to produce a speed for electric and magnetic waves that is the speed of light, surprisingly. But mm -hmm. there's no statement in the theory that says, with respect to whom? Is the, is the speed the speed of light. It's just there in the equations. And so what Einstein said is, these equations are valid regardless of the perspective. Doesn't matter how you're moving. He elevated this to a principle. Okay. Um, and then he took advantage of some, some math that was already available to, to, to produce a mathematical structure, which says, regardless of how you're moving, you always measure the speed of light. And that's a special theory of, of, of relativity. So the, the idea that the speed of light is a, is a constant is a more primitive idea doesn't emerge from the general theory. It's at the foundation of the special theory, which then gets incorporated into the general theory. So in the general theory, you're, you're still saying every observer, every experimenter does a measurement, will get the, the speed of light in their laboratory. Interesting. So we'll get the same speed, which is... Mm -hmm. So based off of Einstein's theories, um, we... we came up with a, well, Einstein came up and scientists that followed him came up with um, uh, theor theoretical mathematical equations that predicted that the possibility of a singularity was possible. How did that evolve from that idea uh, derived through math to the point where we could actually detect a black hole? It's an amazing, it's an amazing history. So, I mean, Einstein published his equations I'm not sure that's it's fair to call them his equations. Really, it was Einstein and a, and a famous mathematician that came at it in different ways, and they both got the same equations. Okay. Um, and so sometimes they're called the Einstein-Hilbert uh, equations. Uh, but within a few months of these equations being published, um, an astronomer uh, worked out how space and time behave in different regions of space under a simple assumption, which is that there is a, a, some spherical object that's just sitting there, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like the Earth, although the Earth isn't just sitting there. But for simplicity, he said, let's look at the theory, see what the mathematics gives us for some spherical object that's just sitting there in space. What is it doing to space and time? Um, and, uh, you know, there's an amazing story here because this, this person, this was during World War I, and this guy was in the trenches doing these calculations. And he did the calculations. He sent his results to Einstein, who was kind of amazed because he, he thought the calculations would be too difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And they're really just a page of, of calculations. An undergraduate can do it. Um, and unfortunately, within a few years, the, the astronomer died at the front, contracted mm -hmm. disease. Um, and, but these, cal these calculations basically said that something very strange was happening at some place in space. And what, what to make of that? It, it, it was kind of like saying that time stops and something weird is happening with space. Space is stretching. Space and time are stretching to the point where they're breaking. And initially, you know, when you get that kind of thing in math with something is infinite, you kind of say, well, nature doesn't really behave that way. As you're getting close to this strange point where things are singular, the math is just breaking down. Mm -hmm. Right, so people didn't know what to do with this. Einstein never really believed in, in, in black holes. It took a long time. People were looking at at what is the meaning of of of, of, of time stopping, and and they they uh, introduced the concept of a frozen star that was part of the vocabulary in the first few decades. Hmm. Um, and then eventually, little by little, it was actually uh, Oppenheimer, the, the guy that worked on the atomic bomb who uh, did some calculations showing that you could cross this region where time allegedly stops. And when you do that, you realize time isn't stopping. It's like time stops from the perspective of an outside uh, individual who's looking at what's happening 
to the individual moving towards this strange region, but the individual is moving toward that strange re region doesn't notice anything anything strange. And it was very counterintuitive stuff. People, you know, people were attacking yeah. these ideas from the beginning. And there's a long history. It, it's not until Penrose, who recently got the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1962, that who showed under more, more general assumptions that these kinds of things actually should exist in space and can form in somewhat natural situations. You know, I, when I, Einstein was saying, well, these, these, these strange places don't actually form. They're probably inside of stars and, and not outside, so we don't have to worry about it, things like that. He never really believed in this mathematical uh, and these mathematical objects. You know, you can't stretch the theory to that point. Um, so it took a long time, and they weren't respectable until the 1960s. But they were there in the math. I never heard of a frozen star. Uh, I didn't know the history of it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. that's, that's news to me. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of a nasty history, actually, early on. You know, Einstein published the theory in 1915, and people, in, included, you know, including uh, many people in, in the physics community, were, were very annoyed by these ideas. Uh, they didn't like them, and they were attacking them from all sorts of perspectives that had nothing to do with science. You know, you could hear, you could hear physicists saying, you know, respectable physicists saying things like, this, is, this theory is way too Jewish. You know things like that, and that when you go when you study general relativity, you'll you'll mm -hmm. study the behavior of space and time in different regions uh, from different perspectives, and you'll see names attached to these studies. And if you go and look at the history, you'll find that some of these people uh, who whose names now are associated with a, a greater understanding of what's mm -hmm. really going on. They were initially trying to show that theory was nonsense. Wow. So there yeah, was a so lot of that. Yeah. We go from, from like we said, you know, a, a mathematical equation that, you know, got a lot of, of uh, kind of negative uh, feedback from a lot of people to something where we could actually prove to it, it exists. And now we have a photograph of a black hole, all, all within that time frame. You so, just fast forwarded another 50 years. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so I guess the point of that is just it's amazing that, you know, the, through the power of science, they just basically took what the math was showing and then were able to uh, predict not only that this something that we've never seen before exists to the point where it's like, where can we point a camera so we could actually take a picture? And that's that's what amazes me is that this wasn't something that we observed um, and then and just said, hey, what's this thing? It's more of something that the math showed us a way to discover this. Well, I, I would also say that there was a, an enormous amount of indirect evidence over the decades, starting in the 1970s from X-rays, right? X-ray astronomy developed during that time. Mm -hmm. And people were working on theory um, and theory and observation were really coming together. The Hubble Space Telescope gave us insights into the centers of galaxies and the idea of black holes being at the center of every galaxy really emerged from the data from the Hubble Space Telescope. So we weren't seeing black holes directly, but we were inferring their existence from, from the data. And it was only in 2019 that we actually took a picture of this, of, of the center of this galaxy that's 53 million light years away um, from the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, it's called. Mm. And it's an amazing image. It could have been anything. And, and yet we see some light around uh, a dark spherical kind of object. There's some subtlety there because the resolution yeah. is, is what it is. You just have to patch empty spaces there. But, it could have been anything, you know, and uh, we look at the simulations of what we expect this thing to look like and what we actually saw. It's an amazing thing that we were able to take this picture in our lifetime. Talking about the, the one that uh, many dubbed the Eye of Sauron, that, mm. that particular one. I haven't, I haven't heard that. Really? I don't know <laughs> how you missed that. That's amazing to me. Really? 
Yeah, it does. If you look at it, it does kind of have a, a resemblance to the Eye of Sauron from the uh, Lord of the Rings movies. So, oh. <laughs> no, I hadn't heard that. I had a question about the this this time discrepancy. Um, so, is there ever actually a point um, before, after, or at the event horizon of a black hole where time actually does "quote unquote" stop? Is there a zero point, if, if it makes sense? Okay, so so one of the counterintuitive ideas to emerge from relativity is that there isn't one clock in the universe that uh, keeps track of time. There isn't one time. So depending on how you're moving and where you are, meaning are you close to massive objects or not, time runs differently for you. So for example, time here on the surface of the earth runs more slowly than you know, in the Himalayas because you're further away from the earth. And you can, we can now measure that difference. Right? We, can look at the, we can do the calculations and say, well, uh, you know, at the top of some mountain, uh, the, the time will run faster, maybe at the 12th or 13th uh, decimal point. It's not a big difference because of the mass of the Earth. Mm -hmm. But exactly, you'll see that, you'll see that in, in, in atomic clocks that can measure that, uh, that difference. So there are, there are times in the theory. There are different times. There isn't one time. And so you can say, what is, how is time running near a, a, a massive object? And the answer is it runs more slowly. The so black hole is a place where time on the clock of the individual that's near the black hole um, is running. And as you cross the event horizon, right, from the perspective of the calculations, what you'll see is that essentially time runs to a halt. And so outside, time is passing. And as you cross the event horizon, uh, time basically comes to a halt. But if you look at it from the perspective of the individual fa falling through the event horizon, uh, what you find is that time is passing normally. And the time outside of the event horizon is passing extremely, extremely quickly. Right? So basically, as you fall into the event horizon from the perspective of the theory, you can do this in calculations, if you look out into the universe at large, you see the universe sort of speed up, right? Because time out there is passing uh, relatively uh, fast, faster and faster and faster. In fact, you, basically uh, an infinite time passes as you cross the event horizon from the perspective of the math. Um, so the event horizon, you know, it's, it's a very strange place because this is, you know, when you do relativity, you immediately jump into black holes. Well. You quickly get into black holes because all the theory is about is, is how space and time curve or warp, and the extreme of that is the black hole. But the Earth does the same kind of thing. Just, the more mass you have, the, the more extreme your, your curvature of space and time are. That's what the theory is about. So I have a, um, a, a question. So, I, I mean, neutron stars made out of neutrons. Black holes, what, what are they made of? empty space they were they were formed right from, from the perspective of the theory they were formed uh by matter the density was sufficient density doesn't even have to be that great you can have a normal density um but you have enough mass in a certain region and what you'll get is that it's enough to curve space and time sufficiently that you'll get this event horizon so, um, so when you get a little bit more into the theory, what you what you what you realize is the theory is about um, regions that are connected to other regions causally. You know, how can I influence that region over there? And the black hole is kind of a region where the region that you can influence sort of closes in on itself and pinches itself off from the rest of the universe because of the curvature of space and time. And so you are in some sense in the infinite future when you cross mm -hmm. the event horizon, right? The, 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 it's like the, the outside an infinite amount of time has passed and you're no longer part of that space and time. It's, it's not like there's a force there that's keeping you from 
accessing the rest of the universe. It's 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 a, it's a well, I'm, I'm back. That's kind of confusing to me. You say that the it, when the, when you cross quote unquote the event horizon, you see some sort of infinite future, but yeah. the the black hole itself isn't going to be an observer of an infinite future, right? Because black holes will decay unto themselves. So it sounds like what you're saying is, if you were to cross the event horizon of a black hole, you would see things that not even the black hole itself would possibly be able to see. Um. In terms of what you see and what the math tells you is there, there's there's some they're not the same kind of thing. Okay. And things can be very tricky. Um, but certainly this is where our intuitions start to fall apart because certainly black holes evaporate. Mm -hmm. um, and this leads to to problems with things like the information paradox that you may have heard heard about. Um, but now we're we're dealing with trying to make sense of, of relativity and quantum physics together. How do we know that uh, black holes evaporate? Uh, that's just a theoretical calculation. Um, so there's this amazing fact about general relativity, which we think of it as a theory of gravity. And yet, when you look at the equations, and in particular, when you look at the equations of black holes, you know, stuff falls into black holes, what happens to the black hole? And you can do these calculations. And what you get is that the description of how a black hole is changing involves equations that look exactly like the equations of thermodynamics. Now, th thermodynamics seems to be like a completely different subject. Mm -hmm. It seems to be about gases and, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the heat content of a gas and how the gas radiates. And when, but strangely, this is why, how, why uh, Stephen Hawking is famous, because what he was able to do is to, is to show that we need to take these this parallel seriously. And what that means in some sense is that, uh, at least according to some people, that gravity is really about heating and cooling of space and time. And I can't tell you what that means. Mm -hmm. okay. But from the perspective of, of the parallel, that the equations look, look exactly the same. So when we talk about thermodynamics, we're talking about heating objects and the cooling of objects and the radiation of objects. And so when you look at black holes, they seem to behave in exactly the same way, at least mathematically. So if you take that parallel seriously, that's what Hawking did. Then you basically conclude that a black hole is uh, uh, an object that has some heat, uh, it's, it has some temperature, and it therefore it must be radiating. Okay. And he showed using quantum mechanics uh, how that process works. Now, um, what the the process you're describing, uh, the radiation unto itself, is um, as, as I'm sure we're all aware, is what's known as uh, the Hawking radiation, uh, so named after the man who who uh, right. discovered it, quote unquote, or, or theorized yes, yes. it. Yes. Um, now, I've actually got a, a question about this. Uh, excuse me, that was a weird way to say that. I've got a, a question about this, which kind of been bugging me for a while. Now, it's my understanding that um, Hawking radiation is essentially what happens when um, uh, uh, virtual particles pop in and out of existence at the event horizon, such that one of the particles uh, uh, escapes into normal space time and the other one falls into the well of the black hole. Uh, and somehow in this process, because one escapes and the other one fell into a black hole and we can't just get something out of nothing, somehow, some way, the black hole unto itself has to make up this difference. There's now energy in the universe that seemed to come out of nowhere. So that energy therefore comes from the black hole itself. Um, now, my, my question is this, is this just a, a, a matter of like the energy, the Hawking radiation that is radiated away from the black hole is like positive energy and only the quote negative energy gets sucked into the black hole and therefore the negative energy decreases the energy of the black hole? Is, is that? Yes. yes. So it, it, when I studied this as a graduate student, it seemed very exotic. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
we really should think of this as, uh, as, a, as a lot less exotic than it might seem and more along the lines of what you said right at the end of your statement, right, right at the end of your question, where nothing's coming out of the black hole. Things are always, things can fall into black holes. And in this case, what's falling into a black hole is something with negative energy. And then that's not, um, that's not a very strange kind of concept. So and, are you saying then that um, the energy of the black hole spontaneously just decreases, but it can never spontaneously increase? And so therefore you're going to have a, a net negative in the grand scheme? Yes, the black hole can only radiate uh, away its energy. It's behaving like a thermodynamic body. So it has some heat, and so it's radiating some of that energy away slowly, and therefore, um, eventually, it will uh, disappear, or maybe explode is the better term. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that sort of in in the this, uh, at the end stage of that. But I, I wouldn't say there's anything terribly uh, deep about the idea that the, that the black hole. Is uh, has temperature. You're just you're, you're taking uh, positive and negative energy, which add up to zero. And near the event horizon, right? If you're that close, if the negative energy particle falls in, then you'll have a net positive energy on the outside. The black hole mass uh, or energy decreases. And the positive particle is kind of like radiation coming off the black hole. Right. So, you know, if hopefully kind of kind of see that mm -hmm. it seems like on the inside of that circle there, it it be the negative energy and the more negative energy you have, uh, the smaller and smaller the black hole becomes. But what my question is this ultimately um, my confusion is why is does it why is it the case that the negative energies mm -hmm. only ever get um trapped in the well why don't the positive energies get trapped in the well and make it bigger no, was, sure that's mostly what happens in fact black holes are getting bigger and bigger because of m regular stuff dominating in this kind of process and so black holes are actually getting larger because uh regular stuff like stars and gas and dust falls into black holes mm -hmm. and forms these things that astronomers observe called accretion disks and they're extremely bright. These are the, these are these things called quasars. So most of the of the way black holes evolve is by getting bigger and bigger. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. So what the other process is that is, is it observational is completely negligible, but it will come into play in the distant future. Yeah, which is actually where my question, I, I believe, is is most relevant. Like, let's just, just assume turn that there my is. Window. I'm getting too much sunlight coming in. If you give me just one second here. I'm gonna... Oh sure. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. Your son is right fine. in my face here in my window. I just, just kept so, myself from it. I, I'm sorry. I meant to actually ask that question in in a in a vacuum. So, it, a black hole in a vacuum, it as far as I, my understanding is concerned, is it will only ever get smaller because of the Hawking radiation. And the Hawking radiation is this little circle of the thing that I just essentially described and, and drew for you. But why is it the case that the negative energy, first of all, we had a, a question that was put on the screen. I'll ask that one too. Why does the negative energy part, why do negative energy particles decrease? It's not that the negative energy particle decreases. The negative energy particle adds to the black hole but you're subtracting there. Okay, yeah. So then um, my question is, is why is it um, the case that these black holes only ever get smaller in a vacuum? Um, why, it, 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 is it not random that the negative particle energy particles wind up on the wrong side of the well? Or is it always the mm -hmm. case that the negative- Okay, so that, yeah, now you're talking about, um, uh, the physics of what's called the ergosphere of a black hole. Okay. So this is a region that's associated with uh, rotating black holes. And the, the first solution to this 
kind of object uh, was was uh, was completed in the in the 1960s, early 1960s, and so there's a strange region where we can we can see how positive and negative negative particles behave, um, and that's where your explanation is. So it, it's mm -hmm. it, it's physics governs the orientation of the positive and the negative particles. Is that what you're saying? Uh, so there's quantum physics associated with the positive and negative particles. Mm -hmm. And then there's a feature from general relativity associated with rotating objects. And that's called this ergosphere. So th this, this behavior of rotating objects, you know, how do, how do space and time change or warp or curve near objects? It's going to be different if the object rotates, you'll have an additional strange feature. That feature is extremely weak near the Earth, but it's been measured. Mm -hmm. Something called gravity probe B measured this, this dragging of space and time near the Earth. That's a feature from the, that, that emerges from the mathematical structure of the theory. Rotating objects, the Earth rotates, drags space and time. And that's a very counterintuitive thing because what does it mean for, for space much less time to be dragged. We think of things moving in space, and now we, we look at the math and we see a notion of space itself being moved or being dragged. It's like space near the rotating object is moving more around the, the rotating object compared to further away from the rotating object. And I don't know what to say to you because I, I can't wrap my head around that kind of a notion. Mm -hmm. But all I can do is look at the, at the, the calculations and part of those calculations are required to, to explain uh, something that astrophysicists observe called jets. Yeah. But it's a very counterintuitive idea when you look at this in detail, because it just, I don't know what it means to say that space is moving. Well, isn't that like, I, like forgive me, but I, I thought that was a huge part of cosmology altogether was the idea that space itself is is moving and expanding at exponential rates. that's that's yeah that's a different uh, mm -hmm. that's that's so that's the 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 expansion of space right so you can you can you can explore that concept without any notion of space moving whereas near the rotating black hole space itself is moving relative to space somewhere else further away the expansion oh. of the universe um, you could think of that as simply things being static. And, and then maybe the best way to think of that is to imagine a balloon. So yes. the, 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 the surface of the balloon represents three-dimensional space and galaxies uh, can be represented as, I don't know, uh, buttons or coins that you stick on the balloon, right? So, so these things are sort of fixed with respect to each other, but the space between them increases. So in a sense, they're not moving, but the space between them increases. Right, for example, the coin or the button isn't expanding, right? So there's a sense in which it's just sitting there. That's where it always was, but the space between them is expanding. And this is also a difficult idea to, for people to wrap their heads around. You know, astronomers confuse these things. In fact, in, in the, when we talk about measuring the expansion, uh, the, the, uh, the, the red shift or the Doppler shift of a distant galaxy, of a very distant galaxy, we talk about it in terms of it moving away from us very quickly. But that's not the right way to talk about it. We really should be talking about it in some other respect. It's, this is not motion in space. It's the expansion of space itself. Um, and it's it's a very tricky concept. you know. If, so, is that yeah. to say that there's a difference um, between saying that space is expanding and saying that space is stretching or being warped even? It's a different kind of warping. It's maybe, maybe we could say it like that. Okay. The warping near a rotating black hole or near any rotating object is of one kind and the expansion is of a different kind. It's also part of the equations of general relativity. When you look at the theory, you can see um, what kinds of what's the behavior of the scale factor of the universe. 
right. So you, you can do this calculation in general relativity under some simple assumptions. You know, all everywhere in the universe, things are distributed uniformly, and you can get this this kind of expansion. Um, but so it is part of the theory of of curved space and time. But see, so the difference is that all of your buttons on your balloon. They, they, they measure time in exactly the same way because they're all expanding in exactly the same way. So they are, the, all of those clocks are sort of keeping the same time. Mm -hmm. And if you're moving with respect to those, then the, the time that you're keeping is different. Whereas near the rotating black hole, your time is, is, is very quickly very different closer, the closer you are to the rotating object compared to further away. So the warping of space and time is very different in, the, in two pictures, right? There's, so the, there's sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the picture I have in my head, and for, just help me if this is wrong, but this is just the picture I think that you painted in my head. Uh, so if we imagine those pennies and such on the balloon as it's expanding, uh, the balloon skin, we, we know that it's, ex, it's being stretched as it gets bigger and bigger, right. but is the rotation of the planets, like if you were to, like if they were glued onto that balloon, and you were just kind of, twisting them as it's expanding it would also stretch yeah. the balloon even further is that kind Sorry, of you said a, planets uh, or whatever it is just the massive objects in general yeah um, what, that, what's that represented spinning. by the pennies and stuff like yeah that, that okay. oh sorry so what, what's represented by the penny or the button or whatever this thing is what's the scale of this thing that's clearly not expanding right yeah this thing's fixed there the balloon is expanding that represents the space what uh, how large is the scale that doesn't participate in the expansion of the universe and so the answer is the solar system isn't part of any expansion our galaxy isn't part of any expansion it's all one unit our our, our neighbor galaxies aren't part of this expansion in fact a galaxy a million light years away from us is moving towards us nothing to do with expansion there's a local group of galaxies uh, you know enormous distances nothing to do with expansion all of that is part of the penny or the button doesn't uh, there's no you don't see any expansion um you have to go uh hundreds of millions of light years away before you start to notice the redshift mm -hmm. of objects the redshift tells us about uh in the words it's difficult you would say the, the motion away from us that's not really the right way to think about this, but let's just talk about it like that. On very large scales, right, then you'll start to notice that every, everything on those scales, wherever you look in any direction, has the same redshift. So it's expanding away from us. None of this local stuff, call it local, but we're talking about tens of yeah. millions of light years radius from us. None of that stuff is expanding away from us, from us in the expansion of the universe. Expansion is a large scale phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I get you there. I just mean that, like, um, I, I'm trying to compare these two different versions of expanding and stretching and uh, twisting of the uh, of the universe in ways that uh, are intuitive to me. I'm a very visual thinker, and and I can I can do this a number of different ways. And personally, in my brain, I imagine um, a ball of putty that's just the more it doesn't matter how much you expand it it's always just going to be a, a big ball of putty uh and then i imagine that um that the there are things in there that are moving relative to this expansion rate but mm -hmm. then as they spin they they adhere to the putty and because they're adhered to the putty it it warps the putty as it's spinning uh also mind you the putty itself is also expanding um, and so is this an appropriate? Yes, this is, this, is, this is perfectly fine. Okay. This is perfectly fine. So the, the things are moving, right? So locally, you'll see all sorts of motions. And from the perspective of the theory, you're dragging space and time. What does that mean exactly? I can't describe it. But you're dragging space, let's leave it at that, around as you're moving around. That, that's all locally all of that yes has to be taken into account but overall from the from 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 a uh, a more global perspective we can measure what is the warping of the universe what is the curvature of the universe and it doesn't seem to be very curved at all 
So there's not enough stuff there for the universe to be that curved. Okay. So, you know, if we look at any space, you know, it's Euclidean geometry is a good enough approximation. So I'm, you know, when, when it comes to black holes and what we can learn about them, um, as somebody who's uh, been interested in black holes your entire life, is this something that, well, I would assume anyway, I'm sorry, that was an assumption, uh, but somebody who's dedicated his life rather uh, to the study of black holes. Uh, do, you, do you, What do you think we have to gain as a species? Um, Long-term, short-term, whatever. Like, what do you think ultimately we have to gain from the study of black mm -hmm. holes? Um, I have, so from, from my personal perspective, I'm not interested in practical things. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested in, in understanding. And at, at some point, I, I actually said, I hope there are no applications because... Um, <laughs> It's kind of scary when what you study, if, if what you study can have a real impact on, on the lives of people, you know, if, 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 it, if it's a life and death situation, it can be kind of a scary thing to be responsible for that kind of thing. And so I, I kind of like that there are no, uh, I like to think of the absence of practical applications. Um, but this is completely false because in fact, you know, we're communicating on, on a device that exists because of people studying black holes, right? Uh, the internet works because we can communicate in real time because mm -hmm. six black hole astronomers in Australia figured out how to uh, allow uh, signals to be processed in real time. And what they were doing is trying to detect black holes, exploding black holes, mm -hmm. right? That, that at the end of their lives as a result of Hawking radiation. And they they realized it was too difficult to do, but in the, in the process of doing that, they, real, they realized that they could solve the, the, the Wi-Fi, the, hi, the high-speed Wi-Fi problem, which, you know, existed in the early nineties as the internet started to come online, right? Um, and so there it is, a straightforward, you know, we, we work on these computers and we expect to get at our website in real time in a fraction of a second. And the only reason that's possible is because, because people studied black holes, <laughs> right? Interesting. Um, that's awesome. The GPS system, right? That's yeah. the same thing. It's, I knew you know, that. I was playing around with space and time, putting these mm -hmm. ideas together. And now I actually had, uh, uh, had an office mate when I was a postdoc at, at uh, NASA, the JPL in, in Pasadena, who was working on the GPS. And I said, how much of general relativity do you need to, make, to, to, to get this GPS to work? And he said, well, you need a little bit. It's like 5%, but over time it builds up. And you, you know, you'll miss your exit if you don't take curved space time into account. So it's, it's pretty amazing. There are practical applications. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd heard that one before. That yeah. GPS is dependent on it, so. Right, right. Yeah, no, honestly, I think that's perfectly fair. Uh, and I'm right there with you. I, I only care about space, cosmology, and all of that because I find it interesting. And it, yeah. uh, and if that's all, if that's the only reason why anyone ever decides to get into it, more power to you. And like you had mentioned, there are certain byproducts of that study that we get to benefit from as yeah. a society. And uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll say this ironically, God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> I yeah, we learn nature at a deeper level, and that's necessary for practical applications as well. Mm. Can you give us like, some quick insight um, about um, spaghettification and uh, firewalls when it comes to black holes? Uh, spaghettification is a silly name <laughs> given <laughs> to uh, what happens to you if you fall into a black hole. So... If you look at the equations, as you're falling into the black hole, what the equations tell you is that you the gravity between your head and, and your feet rapidly gets uh, grows. The difference of, in the gravity between your head and your feet gr uh, grows. So the gradient in the, in the gravitational field becomes very strong eventually. The smaller the black hole, the more dramatic that, that effect is, that difference is. Um, and then you, you, you also get squeezed as a result of the warping of space and time. And so you basically get 
pulled into a noodle, mm -hmm. then you break up. And so they, they refer to that as being spaghetti, spaghetti five. So what is the firewall then? Uh, the firewall, this is, uh, so a recent study, um, well, recent now it's maybe eight, nine years old, um, about what's going on near the event horizon uh, as, as, as you're falling in, but trying to understand it, not just from the perspective of general relativity, which kind of leads you to this idea of spaghettification, but also trying to incorporate quantum physics into this. Um, and so if you look at quantum mechanics, so, so none of this is very certain, but it looks like you might end up uh, getting uh, heated and roasted. <laughs> That's a possible uh, situation if you bring in quantum mechanics and you understand quantum mechanics uh, sufficiently. Um, I can't give you much of the details here, but that come people are trying to are trying to understand black holes seem to be the place where we'll be able to to to, to marry general relativity and quantum physics, which right now they don't make sense. They kind of they don't make they don't seem to like each other, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And black holes seem to be the place where we'll we'll be able to figure out how to get them to sort of live together, and this firewall thing um, is part of that project understand that and so where, yeah. where, where do these two theories break down exactly like why is it that these two things don't mesh so quantum theory says that well so, so they break down in different ways in in, in there, there are mathematical ways that, that in which they break down that i don't find terribly interesting you just get infinities in the math and you don't know how to get rid of them this happens all over the place in physics, but there are there are ways of getting rid of these infinities. There's a way there are ways of taming these infinities. It doesn't seem to be a way of doing that when you're dealing with with general relativity and quantum theory, trying to put them together. So something is not right with that project. One one more sort of physical way of thinking about this is that quantum theory basically says that things can exist in multiple places at once. But the theory of general relativity says that space and time are curved by the stuff of the universe. So what do you mean by the curvature of space and time over here if the stuff of the universe is both like this and like that at the same time? Does that mean that the curvature of space and time is both like this and like that at the same time? Right, that's what you're getting, and is it? How do how do we make sense of this? Are we do we have to average in some sense? Right, it looks like there's some kind of conceptual problem here. Right, we want to we want a notion of a unique a curvature of space and time everywhere in the universe, given the distribution of matter and energy. But quantum mm -hmm. theory says that there's no such thing as the unique distribution of matter and energy. It's kind of like both a little bit like this and a little bit like that, or in many different superpositions. And so ultimately, the curvature of space-time has to be in superpositions. So that's the case, if that's the case, then is it not the case that uh, space is both curved and not curved? Because you have that simultaneous positioning going mm -hmm. on of the particles. So at, at the quantum level, that has to sort of hold, right? So wh what do we mean by, uh, you know, an object is both here and there, and therefore space and time are, bo are both, uh, space and time is in a combination of being curved this way and that way. That's what we get. And uh, we've actually done some experiments where we seem to have where that seems to have borne out. You can actually show that that's the case. Okay. That is that going to lead us to, to making sense of the math ultimately? I don't know. That's sort of the hope. Mm. But we're starting to deal with very counterintuitive notions. 
extremely i'm not yeah uh, i'm no offense i'm having a uh th you were right at the edge of my limits of understanding i, I have yeah. trouble <laughs> even describing these things at some point i i can imagine it especially describing them in a way that that you know people who are not uh studied in this subject can understand so as we're getting closer to the uh top of the hour i do want to remind anybody if they have any questions definitely uh put them in the chat and we can go ahead and ask dr david uh your questions um oh actually we do have one right now what is a singularity in a black hole that's just a place where the math breaks down so that's a place where uh General relativity and quantum mechanics need to come together to tell us what's happening. And general relativity by itself falls apart just by itself there because we get infinities. So we don't we, we know that we can't make sense of the math of general relativity at the singularity. But we also think that that quantum theory has something to say about what's going on there because all of the stuff is there and uh, the universe uh, is, you know, it's it's tininess and massive. And general relativity is about massive stuff. Quantum mechanics is about tiny stuff. So they both have something to say about what's going on there. We need a, we need a theory to make, to make sense of this. But ultimately, it's just a place where things fall apart. We can't make sense of the math. Could you give an example of um, one of these types of infinities that you're referring yes. to? Which so, are sure. So if you've, if you've uh, in, in a physics, in, in an introductory physics course, we think of the, the, the force of gravity from Newton's law of gravitation. Uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation, which it decreases, it says the mass. Sorry, the, the force of gravity depends on the on, to the on the mass of the two objects, say this, the Earth and the Moon, and it's inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. So you get a one over r squared. R represents the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of the Moon. But at r equals zero, so if you bring the Earth and the Moon together, right? making mm -hmm. r smaller and smaller then when r is equal to zero you're dividing by zero that's equivalent to infinity of course the resolution of that is well you can't really put the moon and the earth both at the same point because the mass is distributed so you don't really have a problem there something like that needs to happen for the black hole singularity uh, fair enough so, yeah that makes sense i see another uh question in the chat from cat the humanist why could tiny black holes explode? Because they radiate, and eventually, if all they do is radiate, they'll radiate everything away, and, and, that, and the process of, of, of evaporation, of radiating away, uh, in, in, uh, the rate increases dramatically as you get toward the, the end of the object. Um, the less there's left of it, the faster it's going to radiate away, and mm -hmm. so it goes so fast at the end that it's like an explosion. Wow. But okay. it's just the process of, 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 of getting rid of stuff. So hey, speaking of tiny black yeah. holes, uh, the uh, Large Hydron Collider, to the best of your knowledge, have we ever created tiny black holes? Uh, no. Why or why not? <laughs> oh, why is that know. impossible in the Large Hydron, for example? Uh, why, I, why, I, why I would say it? it's impossible. Um, all you, what you need from the perspective of the theory is to put enough matter into uh, a, a certain region. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be able to, to create this. These would be small black holes, so they would evaporate fairly quickly. Um, why, does the, uh, why does the collider not do this? Um, again, I, I live kind of in la-la land. I'm a theorist. These are practical issues that I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really know. I, I'm so sorry, I, I, I kind of brought that, that up in jest yeah, because fine. there was this big conspiracy theory yeah, a while no, ago right. that yeah, people yeah, thought yeah, when they right. turned on that machine, they were going to create micro that's black right. holes yes. that destroyed the air. Yes, yes right. I remember that. Yes, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts for you, Caleb? Oh, looks like we got another question. Before we get to those final thoughts, do micro black holes show that you don't need a supermassive star to create a black hole in the first place? Uh, yes. <laughs> there you uh, go. So, uh, you, you, sort of a corollary to that is how do massive black holes form? And to some extent, we understand the, that the, we, we have the answer to that. There are puzzles about that that we don't understand. The, the, when we look back in time, we see 
we, we, we seem to have the need for very massive black holes to explain quasars, things called quasars. There doesn't seem to be enough time for these things to get that big. So how do they get that big? That's one of the open questions. And another question. Um, what does Mikio Keku mean when he speaks? Mikio <laughs> Keku. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, mean when he speaks of Einstein's effort to ascertain the mind of God. He's using uh, sort of Einstein's uh, philosophical way of talking. Um, when Einstein referred to the, the laws of the universe, he, he, he used uh, this term. That's, the, that's kind of like the mind of God. But what he meant by that was, was uh, you know, the most general laws of the universe. And that's what that sort of refers to. Reading the mind of God is like understanding the ultimate laws of the universe. Interesting. Looks like we've got another one. What is the smallest that a sun could be to cause a black hole? Roughly speaking, maybe assuming some kind of average of amount of iron. So if you take the sun and you, and you, and you, and you bring all of that matter down to about some kilometers or so, scale, then you'll form a black hole. Um, if you have iron, then you have then the density is even higher. It could be larger than that. We, we would have to do the calculation. Um, but it's orders kilometers in radius, obviously much smaller than the sun. And you'd have a black hole. I think I got that right. You could ask a question well, about the Earth. How, how small is the Earth? I think that what they're asking is, uh, what's, the, what's the smallest size of a star you would expect to create a black yes, hole that's after having gone it. supernova. Oh, uh, what? Which stars? Yeah, produce what, black holes. Yeah. Okay. So, so these are very massive stars that produce supernova. So, our sun is not expected to to end its life as a supernova. Um, it's just going to sort of shed its outer layers and, and die off as a, a white dwarf or, or something. Um, the you need you need stars that are t maybe ten times more massive than the sun. Okay, so tens so of times the mass of the sun. That kind of object is heavy enough that it will end up as a supernova. Okay, so uh, and just to be clear, we're talking about mass and not necessarily size per se. Right. Right? Yes, right, right. Okay. Fair enough. So about the, the size will change. The size will change dramatically over the lifetime. Of these objects, the size of the sun will change dramatically in, in a few billion years, given that we understand stellar evolution. And the, the sun will, will, will its size will become so giant that that it'll reach the it'll reach um, I think it'll reach the Earth. <coughs> be, it's expected to reach the size of the Earth. Um, P PSFS here, so super, so Jupiter couldn't possibly become a sun, right? Now, um, I, now you said now I would I would have prefaced this by saying that I know a person. Uh, who yes. actually thinks that this is a legitimate possibility within my lifetime, that, yes. that there's some, some event that's going to cause this, and he thinks he has science to back this up. Mm -hmm. Is this a legitimate possibility? Uh, it could, could this Jupiter legitimately become a star? So what you're, asking, what, you, what you're asking is how you, know, you, need a, you need a strong enough gravitational pull so that, that the stuff at the center is squeezed in enough to to overcome the uh, electromagnetic force, okay? And that's, that's, a, that, that's a large enough force, and gravity is what does it. But Jupiter doesn't have enough mass to do that. So how much mass do you need? I, I, think, I think Jupiter, I would have to do the calculation, but off the top of my head, it's maybe uh, about a tenth of what you need. Mm -hmm. You need to, to put 10 Jupiters together. There That's before you can get right. a, before you <laughs> gravity is enough to create fusion in the center. I've done this math because I've had this conversation before. Yeah, it takes yeah. somewhere at minimum being very generous, about eight times eight Jupiter. Eight times? Okay. okay. Very okay. generous. But most I think the average assumption is roughly twelve or thirteen oh. minimum. Okay. So that was in the right ballpark. <laughs> yeah. All right. Looks like we have another one here. I believe that the holographic principle was presented to explain the information in a black hole. Does this principle or do this principle can be extra? Oh, hold on. Extrapolated to the universe as a whole. Yeah. Do this principle be extrapolated to? 
the whole universe. In principle, I'm sorry, I'm not the guest. <clears throat> <laughs> um, so this is part of that firewall thing. It can be we can connect it to that. We're trying to understand quantum physics and general relativity, and there is uh, something very strange about the way information is stored on the event horizon and it's related to the stuff that's falling into a black hole and this is the holographic principle so you're connecting uh stuff that's inside of a black hole is moving in a three-dimensional space but the event horizon is a two-dimensional space and somehow there's a direct connection between uh you, all you need is a two-dimensional space to encode all the information about three-dimensional uh, stuff in space. Now, we haven't talked about what information is, so this is a very abstract kind of thing, but there's something strange here about the dimensionality of space. Uh, you know, ultimately, we, we can ask, why is space three-dimensional? And maybe through the holographic principle, we can say that's a kind of illusion because all we need is a two-dimensional surface to sort of project the three, to, 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 to generate or create the three-dimensional universe. All the information can be stored on, on a two-dimensional surface, and maybe you can extrapolate this idea to the entire universe, and there's some kind of two-dimensional surface at the edge of the universe that has all the information that you need to project and understand the three-dimensional universe in which we live, something like that. So is that is it? Would it be fair to say then that what you're describing is that there's enough information both on the surface and to describe the stuff that's also within it? Yes. Okay, there we go. Awesome. I just wanted to make sure I understood that, that's all. <laughs> all right, Caleb, time for your final thoughts. My final thoughts. I've, um, I'm constantly blown away every time I have conversations about black holes and space <laughs> and science. I learn something new every time. And I, uh, t t today's no exception. My mind has been blown a couple of times. Um, I, I love those, huh? moments if you ever see me do that by the way i'm not like poking fun or anything those are legitimate huh nice mm -hmm. i love those that that's what i live for um, and uh david i want to thank you for your time uh, i appreciate it a lot I le i've learned quite thank a you I, I always enjoy talking about science yeah and it's fun just to spit back and forth with you as well i i, I thoroughly enjoy this absolutely and how about you dr david any final thoughts before we close out the show tonight keep being interested in science keep asking questions well, with subjects like that, uh, we discussed tonight, that's not going to be hard because it's <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. And yeah, it just it, it stuff talking like this definitely drives that that passion for learning. So yeah, and 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 people like me learn to express ideas better because we struggle with these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so, the professionals are out there. They, yeah. the, the way that they learn this to get to that level, it's not the same way that we talk to our friends about this stuff. They, they, exactly. They're taught a very specific language for very specific things across a very broad uh, series of topics that all come together in the end, which the layman have no understanding or knowledge because they don't need to know it. And when, <laughs> when, when you spend eight years or more just with just deep in that, it, it's really hard to dig your way back out in enormity. And a lot of people do have a difficult time. I, I, I always say, reiterating I'm the like stuff you. That they you said you're very visual, and that's the way I am. I think a lot of people are like that. And so when you when you try to understand the world, you know, I always wanted words, or I wanted some kind of explanation in, ter in terms of things moving around. I wanted a dynamic explanation of things. And sometimes people would say to me, "Look, the real thing is in the math," and that's very hard to absorb. Mm -hmm especially if you don't know the math. Yeah, and math is hard. It's hard for, for everyone. Yes, yeah, it is. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap everything up for the night. So again, thank you, Dr. David, for coming and joining us. Uh, thank, thank you, guys. You, Caleb, for coming and, and helping out with the conversation tonight. Uh, I can tell you're very passionate about this subject, so um, great job. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Wes and Sonny for hanging out in the background with us. And thank, to, thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. And I'm going to leave you on a final note that, that uh, from the Crucible, or I'm sorry, from Secular Soapbox, Bryce had uh, stated a new outro that I really liked. 
So I think I'm going to steal it. Uh, Bryce can yell at me later, but um, thank you all. And we'll see you in the future.